Uh, I should announce a slight change in program, and I should also let you know that until midnight last night, it was very touch and go whether we were going to have a keynote this afternoon at all, because of course, if the government had shut down, then Dr. Shaw would not have been able to come. It turns out that David Lane, who was supposed to come and have a conversation with him, is stuck in Washington doing something. You can tell us what. Implementing things. And so we have uh, Barbara Bodine, uh, a practitioner and ambassador in residence here, uh, has taken his place. Uh, we don't have that much time. I'm going to do a brief introduction. Uh, and first, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Ambassador Bodine. So she is diplomat in residence and lecturer at the Woodrow Wilson School. And she has this very special role of directing our Scholars in the Nation Service Program, which uh, is a way to really encourage and help students uh, pursue careers in the federal government. She has 30 years behind her in US Foreign Service. And she seems to have a knack for winding up in the most interesting places at the most interesting times. <laughs> uh, so for example, um, she was Deputy Chief of Mission in Kuwait during the invasion and occupation of 1990 and 91. She was the first coalition coordinator for reconstruction in Baghdad. Uh, she was the deputy principal officer in Baghdad during the Iran-Iraq war. And then she was ambassador to Yemen between 1997 and 2001. Uh, so she's um, somebody who clearly has a lot to teach our students. <laughs> Dr. Rajiv Shah, we're just thrilled that he could join us today, uh, especially given the difficulties that have been taking place in the capital. As most of you know, he was sworn in as the 16th administer, uh, administrator of USAID uh, on December 31st, 2009. Uh, he has a very long and distinguished career uh, in government and in different types of organizations. I will not read the whole thing, but previously he was undersecretary for research, education, and economics and the chief scientist at USDA, where he dealt with issues such as bioenergy, climate, childhood obesity, food security, food safety. He's also worked in foundations. He was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, heading up their agricultural development program. And he's even been involved some in politics. He was Governor Ed Vandell's transition, uh, member of his transition committee team on health and a health policy advisor on the board campaign. He has an MD from the University of Pennsylvania and a MS in Health Science from Wharton. So please join me in welcoming him. Now, the way we're going to structure this is uh, I think Dr. Shaw will speak for a few minutes and you can come up here or stay where you were seated, whatever you prefer. And then he and Barbara will have a bit of a conversation and then we will have uh, questions from the floor. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And, uh, thank you for inv inviting me to be here and allowing me to uh, join you just after this lunch on a beautiful day. It's nice to get out of Washington, especially right now. <laughs> For a short amount of time, you, you realize the world just seems so much nicer than if you get on the train. Uh, I want to thank Dean Paxson in particular, uh, Ambassador Bodine. I know we have some friends and colleagues in the audience, but I don't know if Doug Mercado is still here, one of a uh, great Wilson grad who's done a lot of work on disaster assistance for us, and I knew he was planning on joining uh, for part of this. And of course, many of you heard from Joshua Bolton earlier this morning, who is such an important leader for this work, both in government and in a very important role right now. So I'm, I'm glad to be here following in his footsteps. And for me, it's really special to be here with Anne Marie, and I think many of you will get to hear from her this afternoon. I understand on the QBDR, um, but Anne Marie Slaughter is, it did something that I think we all aspire to do in government, which is show up, work really hard, give, 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 and get something done. And uh, she got something very important done, and we're very proud to be a small part of that effort, and, and it's just really nice to be with her in particular here today. Um, I thought I might start just by sharing a few sort of uh, personal insights on a little bit of my journey over the last year and a half or so, and then, and then just have an open conversation. In the last few weeks, this has been, of course, the subject of a more heated discussion and debate inside Washington, and those of you in this room uh, bring so much unique perspective and experience to understanding development, diplomacy, how we think about projecting our values around the world, why that's important, 
and why U.S. engagement around the world is so critical. And what's, what's striking, and in sharp contrast to what I imagine is the discussion you're having here, we're actually having a discussion in Washington about whether we can afford to continue to behave like a superpower. And uh, I guess I would just pose uh, a question at the outset here about whether we can afford not to. And, and I'll tell you, I came to understand the centrality of, of my portfolio in the development uh, area as central to national security. But I, you know, when I first heard that we were going to talk about development as a core part of our national security strategy, I'll admit that I had some personal skepticism about that. You know, my, my exposure to this field was through um, nearly a decade of work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in that context, we focused less on the reason we were doing the work and more on the process and the results and the outcomes we wanted to generate. And took for granted, because it was a philanthropy, uh, that we were going to be values driven. In that context, the value was uh, we believed every child born anywhere should have the chance to lead, uh, in a very basic way, a healthy and productive life. And that the lottery of birth shouldn't determine uh, the full set of activities you're able to pursue, including enjoying life itself uh, beyond childhood. And so with that driving motivation, we're just very focused on results. How can we invest in development activities in, in the manner that gets you the most outcomes for the dollars invested? How can you bring business-like practices of evaluation and learning, constant improvement, and, and real understanding of the processes by which we do our work and achieve excellence in that concept? I know you have a panel on philanthropy following this uh, conversation, and I think that'll be a wonderful opportunity to dig deeper into that point of view. So that was where I started. And then I read you know, articles and studies about how, you know, when you actually look at who the terrorists are that are specifically involved in attacks that get all the attention, that they're not usually the, from the most impoverished parts of the communities uh, that they come from. And you have access to significant wealth and financing and are, are disaffected uh, but not perhaps because of abject poverty. So that was my starting point. Uh, but in, in a year and a half of learning, I've really seen case after case after case where our development portfolio and our desire to really help improve the lot and the opportunity set of the poorest people around the world is central to our national security. It's most obvious and much discussed in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And I, I know from those who's here that we could have a wonderful conversation about the evolution of civilian and military integration in, that, in those concepts over the last decade, maybe over the last more than a decade. But today, there is absolutely no question. In both operating environments, our civilian and military approaches are fully integrated, that efforts to promote agricultural development, health and education for poor, the poor and for girls in particular, efforts to build parliamentary democracy, and efforts to strengthen civil service capacity and administration are all seen as absolutely central to core military objectives of transition, stability, and security. And the only debates we still have, of course, are how and when you can start investing in governance and development alongside investments and operations to improve security and stability. And we have joint civilian and military plans, joint rehearsals of concept. It's all very, uh, it's a shared set of responsibilities and I think there's a great appreciation for that. So it's, it's most obvious in those settings. But you can also look at places like Southern Sudan where you know, there was active planning on the military and civilian side for a number of contingencies around the recent referendum for the South. But effective diplomacy coupled with effective development actually mechanically making sure that ballots got out, that people could vote, that, uh, that we we're text messaging uh, communities so they knew where to go to and how to count and had uh, a, a legitimate and viable process there led us to a place where, knock on wood, we are all now hopeful that we can see a path forward in Sudan and southern Sudan that uh, really diminishes the risk of violence and that prevention activity is of course the best form of civilian military integration because we reduce the needs to send troops 
And as Secretary Gates has said, doing development is a lot cheaper than sending soldiers. In the Middle East today, you see major transitions. And of course, we have a number of contingency plans and operational capabilities. Uh, but it is the integration of uh, everything from military support to civil service support to s providing uh, resources to these newer civil society organizations that represent the more dynamic uh, parts of societies that are really seeing through what we hope will be effective transitions to self-determination in that part of the world and in a manner that prioritizes security, stability, economic opportunity for local populations. And I could go on and on. In Central America, our partnerships are around security and vulnerability. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, when I first started and, and spent a lot of time with organizations like AFRICOM, I was stunned by the depth of their planning around, uh, they understood, they had modeling for the prevalence and incidence of malaria in Africa that was frankly better than anything I saw from the World Health Organization. So, so you get a sense of as you start to think much more broadly about our national security, uh, development and the things that we bring are in fact central to that national security. And that of course is most obvious in places like the Korean Peninsula where we all know that we are much safer, more secure with greater economic opportunity when we have more South Koreas and fewer North Koreas. But because it is such an important uh, aspect of, of the way we project ourselves around the world, it's also important that we're aggressively introspective about how we do this work. And that is why this administration has pursued uh, really an aggressive reform of how we do development and diplomacy going forward. And, and Anne-Marie certainly will talk more about this in, with respect to the QDDR. But I'll, I'll just give you a few kind of context points. The first is history. Over the last 20 years, we've seen a roughly 300% uh, increase in programmatic responsibilities in development. What I mean by that is, thanks to strong leadership from President Bush uh, and from prior leaders, we have a PEPFAR program that is saving 4 million lives a year, the President's Malaria Initiative that is reducing the number of children who die from all causes in Sub-Saharan Africa by a third. It's probably the biggest success story in global health we've had in a long, long time. And we've increased our commitments, of course, in areas that are what we call hot areas, Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and planning out the next areas of instability where we're trying to counter violent extremism with deeper and more fundamental engagement around the world. Now, any organization that has a three or four hundred percent increase in their programmatic responsibilities would, would you know, need to build capability in a modern and effective way to implement that well. And uh, in fact, in the United States, we've gone the other direction. Precisely as we took on all these tasks of a more interconnected world and shaping a more interconnected world, we also cut our core capacity to implement these programs by about 40%, by 37% in that same time horizon. And so as a result, you know, if we're stepping back, we were not in a very, we're not dealt a very strong hand in terms of our capacity to do basic planning, implementation, evaluation, follow through in a strategic and coherent way. And I think that's led to, uh, when, I, when I started, I heard this a lot from my colleagues at DOD, including Admiral Mullen and Secretary Gates and others, and General Petraeus, and I didn't understand that this was a compliment until I really thought about it, but they said, you guys are a uh, high value, low density partner. <laughs> and I, you know, I took the low density a little personally and then I said, no, no that just means our head count is low. Uh, but it is in fact true that we are seen as, and we are, a high value but low density partner. And, uh, and given that, we've started an aggressive set of reforms that I'm very proud of, that will not be easy, that will be even tougher now that we have to sell uh, the basic vision to, I think, what is admittedly a more skeptical Congress uh, around rebuilding our civilian capacities, being businesslike and results-oriented. At USAID, we call the reform package USAID Forward, and it includes really the most aggressive operational reforms that any federal agency is undertaking in terms of restructuring how we do everything from procurement to hiring and promoting our officers, to uh, how we engage with the interagency,
to the basic structures we deploy to build partnerships with the private sector and with local governments and local organizations. So I'm happy to get into that more, but the reason we take the reform piece so seriously is because the mission really is super important and yet under-resourced. And ultimately, uh, despite the current environment we're in, I'm very optimistic about our future in development. And the reason is, and I can say this in a university where I think it's just obvious, I, when I visit universities, you see right away college students, graduate students have such a fundamental connection to this work that they don't have to ask themselves why we engage in places around the world. They have grown up in an environment where they feel interconnected with that task and where in the palm of their hands they feel like they're holding the technological solutions that empower them to do something about it. And, uh, and it's just extraordinary. You have, I was at MIT earlier this week where, where students are getting degrees in development uh, on, at the undergraduate level and in development design and they're developing improved wheelchairs that work in fields, they're, they're inventing uh, solar powered illumination uh, for off-grid rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa, water filters that are made out of local materials that can reduce microbial content in water by the same as, as chlorine or added aqua tabs and are much more appropriate for certain communities. I know from my history of working with students that come out of this institution that you produce extraordinarily committed graduates who have a great deal of vision and commitment. Uh, but it's not just in the elite institutions, it's also all over this country. We have programs at community colleges, at large uh, universities. I went to the University of Michigan. Global health, global development courses around this country are completely oversubscribed. Josh might speak more to this at the One Campaign, but I believe the One Campaign now has 2.6 million members, most of whom I suspect are, are of younger generations that believe this country should be committed to eradicating poverty as we know it. And, and you know, that is not just something that's limited to youth. I've spent time in communities of faith and I spent uh, a couple of hours at Saddleback Church just about a month ago. And I was with Kay Warren and her leadership team. And, and she told me they started with their engagement in this space uh, around PEPFAR and around the emergency for AIDS. But as they've sent 14,000 of their members to countries around the world to learn about and engage in development, they've now developed a much broader perspective where they're committed to hunger reduction, they're committed to malaria, they're committed to improving civil society, and they're doing that um, with an increasing and an incredible sophistication and commitment to results. When I go and speak with our military leaders, increasingly there's a focus on training people to understand how to address global health problems, global development, and core poverty reduction problems and do that in efficient and creative ways. So I, I'm very optimistic that, that many of the fights of the past between the civilian and the defense sides, between uh, youth and others, you know, about whether we should uh, engage on a particular disease or a different disease are essentially over and we can come together around a common vision and a common understanding that this type of global engagement is critical to our future we can do it efficiently and be incredibly results oriented. And if we can, we can unlock a huge amount of new constituency and political energy in this country to power development for the next several decades. Um, so that's a hopefully a point of optimism we can start our <laughs> conversation with. I suspect that some of this conversation will speak to the next few weeks and months which uh, are perhaps less optimistic. Mm -hmm. But you know, but this too shall pass and we will get to a place where I think in this, uh, in this discussion and debate that's coming up that we're currently a part of, we will have to simply keep proving and back it up with reality that we're getting better and more efficient and have that be the platform for which we build a much broader and a much bigger commitment to global development as a country, as a government, across our private and nonprofit sectors and for the purpose of keeping us safe and economically secure in really the most efficient way possible over the long term. So thanks for the opportunity to be here and I look forward to learning from you and, and uh, taking some thoughts. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here, uh, particularly at, at this graduate school uh, where 
develop, our development field, I believe, is our largest field among the graduate students. Um, the dean has established a global health program, and so you're, you are preaching, it even looks like you're preaching to a choir, but you are preaching to a choir uh, of people who, I think, support your vision um, and, and your goals. Um, I'd like to go back to, I'd like, I, I don't want to get too hung up on the, on the short term, although I'd like to hear how we get beyond this. But um, both from some of my own personal experience and the study that I get to do here, I think we have started to understand how to do the post-conflict uh, 3Ds, uh, starting with the PRTs, and that's become far more sophisticated. And uh, the work on the QDDR certainly helped formalize and, and institutionalize that. Um, I think one question that, that I would have, and I think some others have, is are we really, at, what steps are we taking to learn the lessons of post-conflict integration of the 3Ds and, and really try to apply them pre-conflict? Um, and I'm looking at the, the, the winter of discontent in the Arab world that, that we're still going through, so much of that was driven by unemployment, education, legitimacy issues, where our policy towards the region had really seemed to be driven by security issues. Um, how do you really see this rebalancing of, of the Ds? I, I did, like, a couple of months ago here, Admiral Mullins uh, say that he would like the military to be the supporting agency again, but I'm not, I'm not really convinced, perhaps, that we've turned that, that corner. If you could address that pre-conflict uh, integration. Well, you know, I, I think the president has laid out a strong uh, framework that begins to answer that and suggested mm -hmm. that, especially in the Middle East, we have a unique and historic opportunity right now to better align our policies with our values. Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we're not doing that for the purpose of simply promulgating our values. We right. do that because we believe our core American values of self-determination, mm -hmm. human rights, and basic freedoms, uh, and open society mm -hmm. are ultimately what create a more sustainable mm -hmm. and durable uh, social stability. And the false stability that can be achieved by uh, you know, a security perspective right. alone, or a short-term security right. perspective alone, uh, I think has been proven to be quite fragile. Mm -hmm. And so, so we are, so that generalized policy guidance yeah. hopefully helps create a, a framework for moving forward. I think the second part of your question speaks to the operational reality right. of, of are we there. Yeah, I agree and, with you in principle, but absolutely. how do we do this? And look, of course we're not there yet. Yeah. You know, that's why we need, we need to take forward the ideas in the QDDR. It's why we need these types of groups coming together and saying, what can we learn from each other and how can mm -hmm. we do it? You know, if you ask me, what are the two or three big lessons from post-conflict environments that would apply to pre-conflict uh, on the operational side? One is the degree to which we plan around building viable local institutions. Mm -hmm. I think we've learned the difference between creating the mirage of success and doing the hard work of understanding um, how you build local institutions, right. how you do that in a way that's not domineering, mm -hmm. uh, but supportive, mm -hmm. and how uh, that's often not an ag about the aggregate resources you're investing, but rather how you're investing them and in who you, you're mm -hmm. investing them. So you can take a, a lot of lessons around building real viable institutions that are open and, mm -hmm. uh, and well-developed and apply them in that context. I think another, another uh, core uh, lesson that we've learned is that there is real opportunity uh, that can be tapped in post-conflict environments and that can apply to pre-conflict right. environments. You know, there's a, a great study that shows across so many different post-conflict uh, areas, once you get basic stability, your economic growth rate can be quite high as countries essentially regress to the mean or recover. Mm -hmm. And in that is real economic opportunity and understanding how to create that economic potential for local communities, for foreign businesses, and for others to engage is a big part of the solution. Those are things we haven't really been thinking about much right. um, and certainly not operationally bringing in uh, in an effective way. 
we just did a deal with uh, Frito Lay to to work in Bamiyan in Afghanistan, okay. where U.S. aid support for improving potato varieties. This is the USDA <laughs> part of me coming out, uh, but. The variety of potato you plant is very important if you want to make potato chips, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, All right. and, and you have now uh, thousands of farmers that are planting improved potato varieties. It has created an entire supply chain and a business model that has allowed Frito-Lay to come in, build a local subsidiary, mm -hmm. create jobs and employment, and move us away from, this, uh, from the alternative, which is largely you know, public funding for labor and activities, which we know will not be sustained or be durable over the long term. So there are a lot of lessons learned. We're starting to apply them. They should be, the application should be accelerated. Uh, but in order to do it, and this was, I think, in my mind, the biggest breakthrough of the QDDR, was we all have to change our mindsets. Mm -hmm. The development people that I get the great honor to work with uh, can't just come to the table and say, we represent the 10 or 20 year view and we know how to do this over that time frame, so listen to us. They have to figure out, we have to figure out, how to have relevant policies and programs that can do six month operational plans, 12 month operational plans, 24 month transition and exit plans. Otherwise, we don't, we're not gonna be effective in that environment. At the same time, uh, the military needs to have planning processes that are genuinely inclusive mm -hmm. and that take seriously the unintended consequences of how we spend resources and how we try to support local communities, and I think you're seeing that increasingly. And our, our diplomats uh, need to really understand what are, and be engaged in um, how our programs and operations affect the local political construct that ultimately is what's required to tie together governments and societies and provide us with those kinds of exit strategies. So I think all of those lessons are very applicable to the pre-conflict right. context. It is just true though that the post-conflict area with everybody working together yeah. and all the resources there helps you get there faster operationally. Mm -hmm. And in pre-conflict context, there's a little bit less of that sense of absolute urgency. Right. Um, and we need to introduce somehow that sense of urgency. Okay. You, you talked about handoffs and timelines and, and, and that nicely goes to uh, my next question is I think um, A, that you, you say it is, is certainly gotten all the recognition that it rightly deserves for uh, your ability to intervene in humanitarian crises. Uh, and that's another area where I think um, the assistance side and the military work very well together. They have the lift capability, you have the, um, uh, the capabilities on the ground, and certainly OTI um, is one of your star elements. The question then becomes, how do you, how are you looking to structure the transition from humanitarian intervention to sustainable um, governance and development? Uh, I, I know this was a particular issue in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, Haiti was a great example and I'm glad you raised that. You know, it was a great example of uh, first, uh, I had heard so much about, and even from so many of our humanitarian NGO partners, concerns about military engagement. Mm -hmm. And I just have to say, the way the United States military conducted itself in Haiti, uh, at least for everyone that they touched in that context, wiped that away. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I had the same people who told me to be really worried about that, you know, two months later coming and saying, boy, it's like a transformed mm -hmm. uh, environment. And, I, and I've shared that with General Frazier and Admiral Mullen and others who were directly involved in setting the cultural tone and expectations for how we'd work together. And I think that made a big, big difference. Uh, I think it, it goes without saying that one of the weakest points of how the United States engages abroad is our ability to effectively plan for and execute these transitions mm -hmm. from emergency environments, whether they are, uh, you know, whether they are wars or natural disasters, mm -hmm. to a stable, long-term development. And it's, it's a very complex issue. I look forward to your ideas on how one fixes that. But it is complicated by the, by the amazing resource differentials yes. that are available during emergency and non-emergency timeframes. And if there's one thing that I would, uh, I, you know, we've done a lot to implement some lessons learned from Haiti, like we now, the minute we have a disaster, we stand up in parallel a transition planning team 
we bring together interagency partners for transition planning and preparation. Some of that led to some really successful efforts around the Japan pro project, which wasn't a high cost project, but it was where we had a lot of uh, federal government technical expertise that could help the Japanese. But uh, in addition to just the planning and operations piece, there's a real resource issue. And somehow in our country, we have to come together and see and not uh, and get out of this mindset that you know we can we can uh, we we under all circumstances will protect funding for our military engagements right. and then we will have and this leads us into the current discussion I suppose right. <laughs> have this sort of knockdown drag out fight over a very small comparative piece which is the diplomatic and the development engagements and to some extent, we've built some interesting uh, financial and appropriations tools to allow for more partnership. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think we have to make the stronger case that we are central to our future in these areas and, and much better resource that body of work. Now, I know that Michael Garrison, in a recent article, uh, certainly gave you high points for making the case in, in very stark terms. And for those of you who um, may not have read the op-ed, uh, it concerned uh, the very real impact of budget cuts in terms of children who would die in Africa. Um, but it, it does, it, it, I think it uh, underscoring, uh, I don't remember which congressman was, was talked, was, was, was rather cynically dismissing your point. But it does bring up this, this question that I think is at the ideological root of some of our funding problems, um, both on the development and the diplomacy side, of how do you, how do you prove your effectiveness? How do you, um, some speakers would even say that assistance can be counterproductive. Um, and, and there's a very short sidebar. I was trying to get scholarships started when I was in Yemen and it takes five, 10, 15 years to show the value of a scholarship. So how are you trying to address the measurability of impact um, so that you can get these resources long term? Well, let me, let me come to that in just a moment. I, since you raised the, uh, Michael Gerson's piece, okay. I'd love to just say a word about that. Th this was a reference to a comment I'd made during a test, congressional testimony about what would happen if we scaled back uh, some of our malaria and immunization um, and feeding programs for very vulnerable, poor children around the world. And, and I was, uh, I, in some sense, a little bit mischaracterized in describe. I was describing the impacts of that, mischaracterized and attributing the impacts to any one political party. But I do think the rest of Michael's article was very appropriate in the sense that it describes how, if we are being results oriented, and if we believe our investments, and we can demonstrate with valid data that our investments generate real results that save lives, by the same token, uh, pulling back on those investments in a fundamental way will have real consequences. Mm -hmm. And we should have a dialogue around what those consequences look like and then how we as a country will be forced to deal with that at large scale over the long run. Because I, I believe, as Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton and so many others have said, that this upfront investment in development and health done to a level of effectiveness is far more efficient than dealing with the consequences of large-scale economic uh, instability or large-scale capital destruction that comes with uh, you know, rampant malaria or HIV epidemics in certain countries. Mm -hmm. so, so I think there is a need to have that discussion in an effective way. But I also believe that there are members of both parties that are deeply committed to this. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, a lot of the biggest gains and global health as a world mm -hmm. happened because President Bush mm -hmm. led in a, in a very effective way, built broader coalitions, put in place results-oriented programs. And just to give you one example, because I think a colleague here has worked on this from Tanzania, uh, we, I just received data back on the President's Malaria Initiative in Sub-Saharan Africa that shows in seven of the 15 countries where we have early data, a simple program that gets a $3 insecticide-treated bed net to children to sleep under, plus spraying insecticides in their home and improving the quality of treatment when they re reach the hospital, has saved 200,000 kids' lives and has saved those lives in a way that is incredibly cost-efficient. And for the first time in a long time, 
it's led to a 30% reduction in all-cause child mortality. And that's, you know, I'm a medical person, so that's really exciting. The reason that's really exciting is it means you're saving kids' lives from malaria, but then you're doing, something else is going on, and you're saving even more kids from things that you may not even be able to identify what it is. Maybe the hospitals are less full of, of, of sick malaria, kids with malaria and with fevers, and they're able to save kids' lives from diarrhea and pneumonia and other other things. So it's a really amazing result. And when we have those kinds of results, I think we should be very aggressive about building on them uh, because the American people have a tremendous capacity to, to sort of buy those results at those costs. So, you know, I think we just have to be very results oriented in how we do our work. We have to have a very mature and friendly dialogue about what's the best way to uh, move forward here. And we have to build continue to build this very strong bipartisan consensus mm -hmm. for this work as we go forward. And then finally, on the point about evaluation specifically, I'm actually very proud of something that our team recently did, led by Ruth Levine, who came to us from the Center for Global Development. But we restructured our entire approach to evaluation. And we, we're now the first development agency around the world that will publish publicly every single project evaluation that's completed. Every evaluation will be done based on a certain set of standards where we collect independent data and it's, the evaluation is done independently. And uh, the learnings will be put on our website within three months of project completion for everything. Mm -hmm. And my goal now is in, in implementing that to make sure that it's all done in plain English <laughs> so, that, so that we can all understand it. It's actually a lot harder to write in plain that's English hard, than it is the, the way most evaluation folks in development <laughs> tend to write. Uh, but, but it's a great first step, and the World Bank in their upcoming meeting is going to announce a few things that build on our, mm -hmm. our, on our evaluation policy. I'm really proud of that, and I think it just speaks to the point that if we can demonstrate with rigor the results we achieve for our investments, we have a much stronger case to make in Congress and around the country. That's, if you can get it into plain English, that will be um, truly a remarkable step. Um, and certainly will help our students as they have to read them because it will undoubtedly end up as part of coursework. Um, the, the previous panel uh, talked um, a little bit about public-private partnerships and I understand that another one of your initiatives is a development innovation ventures, if I have the name correct. Yeah. Um, could you explain that in, in a little bit greater detail because I, again, with Congress and with the American people, I think that it may make development look as if it is more of a, um, who's working on a, on a better model and is, is, is trying to look forward and not just mm -hmm. with old ways of doing things. Well, you know, I think much of development has been government to government or public to public types of investments uh, over the last several decades. And now there is this burgeoning class of entrepreneurs, whether they are in local uh, countries and societies or right here in the United States, inventing new technologies and new solutions, and frankly, tying those solutions to business models where they can mm -hmm. sell their products to very low-income communities, but create both the feedback loop that markets and businesses give you that you yeah. don't often have in the public sector, and allow for real scale and sustainability in a manner that doesn't always need long-term public investment. So uh, some of my favorite examples of things we've invested in through the Development Innovation Venture Fund mm -hmm. is we've taken this venture capital model, we've invested in uh, a diagnostic technology that would be an in-field community-based uh, technology where you just put a drop of blood on a plastic strip and it would let you know if you have malaria or tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And that would dramatically reduce the cost of diagnostics. And for TB experts in the room, it would also help identify the difference between different kinds of TB and uh, improve our ability to treat that much, much, much more efficiently. Uh, another example is an effort to support the development of off-grid energy generation for rural communities. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of technologies, and whether they are solar-powered flashlights or, uh, or or power generation that can be taken from uh, bicycle power or whatever else is, you know, people's form of mobility can then be stored using different kinds of battery cells and used for agricultural value added processing and other things like that. You know, in environments where there is no electrical grid, mm -hmm. uh, it is very, very hard to enable communities to put in place big labor saving technologies. This particular one, coupled with 
a mechanical thr uh, uh, thrasher for corn uh, would save women 50% of their labor time in the post-harvest period in rural sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible savings. And we know when we, when we invest in women and provide them with resources or when we save their basic labor time, they reinvest all of that in generating more income, sending their kids to school, feeding their children, and societies begin to move out of poverty. So, and the beauty of these types of things are if they work, mm -hmm. uh, companies can commercialize them and sell them. And it shouldn't just be, uh, you know, the Asian economies that are kind of investing in these businesses to, to try to win the future with the several billion people that live at the bottom of the pyramid. We need a vibrant American entrepreneurship that is pointed against that target as well. And the De Development Innovation Venture Fund is designed to do just that. That's fascinating. You, you mentioned um, what, what some of these, these programs do in terms of, of uh, improving a lot of women and again there was another uh, op-ed recently by Kathleen Parker uh, where someone described women's issues as pet rocks um, I have it um, but basically that women's issues were a, a tertiary uh, set of programs or a tertiary set of issues they were the luxury ones that you got to after you did everything else um, and that, you know, quoted somebody in the administration as, as basically describing women's programs as pet rocks that were weighing down things that, uh, it, it's quite an article. Um, obviously I do not believe that she, they were quoting you by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I would be interested in you talking a little bit more about uh, women's programs and then women's programs as human programs, as, as how those two are really intrinsically t tied together rather than a separate set of, of, uh, of priorities. Well, you know, the piece you're talking about spoke specifically about the Afghanistan program right. and um, used an off-the-record, off unattributed yes. quote to um, say something very uh, dramatic. The truth is, in Afghanistan, we've put in place a very rigorous gender and women's policy. The reason we've done that is because we know if we're going to have the kind of social stability and the richness of civil society there to enable an effective military transition, mm -hmm. we need women in parliament, we need girls in school, we need women entrepreneurs developing businesses, mm -hmm. and we need women farmers improving their productivity and their production. Women in Afghanistan provide more than 50% of farm labor, which is the largest part of the economy, is the agricultural sector. Um, and, you know, they're just critical across the board. Uh, so USAID has actually been very much on the forefront of putting that policy in place and implementing it. In fact, on my last trip, I had the chance to visit an excellent project called the National Solidarity Program. And it's a program that provides small community grants to communities that come together and refurbish a school or build out a road, do things that improve their economic and social potential. Uh, but what's so exciting about this program is we've insisted with our resources uh, that women should have the opportunity to form shuras and to meet and have dialogue with each other. And I had the chance to sit with a group of women in that conversation and it was just amazing. I mean, they, they said it was the first time they had a chance to be out of the house communicating with each other it was so empowering, it was the thing they looked most forward to. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the girls in their community, just seeing women right. doing this, all of a sudden had a greater commitment to school and wanted to be in school. And so it's just very, very powerful. And we know across the world, and development experts, but every, you know, we all, I think, at this point know quite well the data that shows. The reason Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank was so powerful in Bangladesh is because they focused on women mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and they provided women with resources and found that women had a much higher repayment rate and success <laughs> rate for how they did that. The reason in our food security programs we target women mm -hmm. farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa is in Sub-Saharan Africa women provide more than 70% of total farm labor and are otherwise completely excluded from most public programs. So mm -hmm. the minute you target women you immediately get big productivity improvements in agriculture and those improvements translate into direct improvements right. in child malnutrition and kids in school, which are the two most important indicators for whether a, a rural community over time is going to be able to move out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, we, it, it's such a central component of our work uh, that it's hard to make that distinction that it's right. a human priority or a, or a political yeah. priority. It is just, it, you, you do not succeed in development efforts and thereby you do not succeed in security and stability goals mm -hmm. uh, if you fail to recognize the priority to reach, serve, and empower women. <coughs> and, uh, and so from a pure effectiveness basis, it, it is our top priority, and I, I think USAID is very aggressive about leading that charge. Good, wonderful. And then I'm gonna ask one question that my students have asked me to ask, um, which is, what should they be studying in order to be able to go to work for USAID? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're at the Woodrow Wilson School, that's a, a great start, and we'd you know, essentially love to have you. Uh, we, we need, okay. uh, we, we're going to need some support from our Congress to have the resources to bring in, uh, to bring in great talent. I, I would say a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, I, this, this may or may not be controversial, I don't know, but I, I think one of the things that has been missing traditionally in development as it's been implemented around the world um, is a focus on just management operations. And so I, I don't know, now I'm going to get myself in trouble at the Woodrow Wilson School, but yeah. I, I actually think MBAs and people who have business <coughs> backgrounds uh, can be very, very useful in the context of development. And so if there's an opportunity to <coughs> gain experience that's relevant to that or, you know, understand basic accounting, program management, uh, that's a lot, I think, of what's required mm -hmm. that has been missing over decades mm -hmm. in this space. I'd say the second thing is development's uh, going through a little bit of a renaissance. And in the 70s, we used to talk about agriculture and agricultural development as central. Uh, then the whole world lost interest, essentially. And for the next two and a half decades, we saw development in, we saw agriculture and rural development go down as a percentage of spending in this space mm -hmm. from about 30%, 25% to 3.5% three, three by 2005. And it wasn't until the food crisis of 2008 mm -hmm. um, and the recognition that more than 36 countries around the world experienced serious food riots and instability mm -hmm. and the far less recognized but in many ways just as critical, for the first time in three decades the trend line of reducing hunger went up. Instead of going down, a hundred million people were pushed back into a condition of hunger, including 65 million kids who became stunted mm -hmm. because, and stunting means you are malnourished early in your childhood and you don't achieve uh, height to weight indicators, but more importantly, your brain doesn't fully develop and you suffer long-term uh, negative consequences on your incomes and on social uh, standing mm -hmm. because of that. And so, so President Bush recognized this and in between 2008 and 2009 proposed the largest percentage increase in global food security the United States had proposed in several decades mm -hmm. and President Obama carried the mantle forward and created a program called Feed the Future. Right. So right. I, I would say technical skills in areas like agriculture and areas like health, energy, uh, coupled with uh, the policy expertise that I think you gain in institutions like this and some business background because so much of this is about being efficient and effective and operationally sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, are the types of backgrounds that we look for in our in our programs. Great. Well, as I said, I think if we passed around a piece of paper, you could probably fill your entire next entering class just from this room, but um, <laughs> we'll let them compete with everyone else. Um, I would love to continue this conversation, but I want to open it up to the audience. If you could come down to the mic. Uh, and please, in the interest of time and everyone else, try to keep your questions short and to the point uh, so we can get the most in. Yes, Mary. Um, a lot of the discussion today talked about <coughs> rural issues, agricultural issues. And then um, yourself, please. Sorry, I'm Mary Messing. I'm a senior in the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, my question is about um, more overtly political issues, specifically civil society organizations working on human rights issues, and also um, criminal law issues. Um, and I fully appreciate the, the importance of being able to um, produce rigorous evaluations of the impact of USAID's work, um, but it seems like um, 
a lot of the, the work that USAID does in the more overtly political issues, because they're political, tends to be more technical, and that also lends itself to better, better evaluations. Um, for example, in judicial sector reform, a lot of it is about automating, automating case management systems. Um, and USAID has spent millions of dollars on this. Um, but people like Thomas Carruthers at the Carnegie Endowment have criticized this for um, potentially, in fact, strengthening authoritarian governments by making the administration of an authoritarian form of justice more efficient. And the, there's sort of this problem where the, the initiatives that could actually produce sort of um, a more democratic form of justice in the long term, such as better legal ed education, it's much harder to measure that impact um, so on these more overt um, human rights issues, what's the way to sort of circumvent the problem of not being able to produce sort of hard numbers in the short term? That's a very sophisticated and very smart question, right? <laughs> and I don't think I have an answer for it, so I, I, but I suspect you might, so uh, I'm eager to hear that if, if you do. I, you know, we, we want to be very quantitative and rigorous in how we talk about our outcomes. And part of that is also being very clear about what the vision of success is in different areas. And so, uh, you know, that example is one that I'm less familiar with, but in rule of law sector writ large, sometimes we define success as a process indicator, the number of cases that got completed or uh, the number of judges trained. In fact, I was stunned when I got to aid to see how much of our reporting was around these process indicators and especially processes that I call point of touch processes that we've touched X number of people or that we've, our experts have trained Y number of people as opposed to what that training then leads to. And uh, this won't answer your question, but in the education sector, we had a similar problem where almost all of the data we were getting was about how many teachers we've trained and very little of it was on how much kids were learning in our setting. So we essentially restructured our strategic approach after doing a review of the literature, talking to partners, studying uh, best practices around the world, and found that we can set a target of reaching and helping 100 million children improve their educational attainment to a point where they're reading at grade level throughout primary school in our current programs with no additional cost just by restructuring our strategy and by putting in place standardized testing and then tracking outcomes against that. I don't know if that's possible in the rule of law and justice sector. I just, I know it's, it's far more complex, but I suspect people like Tom Carruthers and yourself and others could in fact come together and come up with a way to define, you know, what is the vision of success and how can we report on that uh, and use political criteria, open society indicators, are out there, we all read them and recognize their value and make that part of the picture so that we're not just counting sandwiches or counting points of touch um, and calling that the result. Good afternoon. I'm David Matthews. I'm the Senior Strategic Advisor for Stability Operations at ISAC Headquarters in Chicago. And I want to compliment you on some of the changes that are happening in AID because it's critically important that AID have a better relationship with uh, the military. Uh, and so thank you for that. What I wanted to ask you was, you've mentioned post-conflict and you've mentioned stability operations, but there's a, there's, there's a point in between those two things wherein there's reconstruction of the fire, mm -hmm. wherein aid workers should be or are out in the field. And I wonder if you just address that. Sorry. You know, I would, I, I think you're, you're right to point out that that is a critical component of what success looks like. Um, I would also point out, as you know this, having been in this setting, USAID and its implementing partners have lost 390 people over the last uh, seven years in Afghanistan conducting programs for stability and reconstruction under fire. It is the unit costs of completion of a kilometer of road under fire versus not is 15 to 18 times higher. And, and so a lot of what I think we have to do is uh, come up with a conceptualization of what are the most urgent and critical reconstruction priorities 
in those active kinetic and dangerous threat environments uh, and understand how we're going to get that work done. And then recognize that there may be a series of other things that are second tier priorities uh, that, that we would legitimately want to wait until there is a basis of stability and security in order to enact and implement. And I, I give our team uh, in Kabul a lot of credit for having just done this with respect to a strategy around in and around Kandahar and the Argandab uh, area. General Petraeus was directly involved with Ambassador Eikenberry. They put a very good civilian military plan together that prioritizes certain sectors like energy and agriculture over others and says we're not going to try to rebuild everything here under fire. We're going to be smart and strategic and for each set of investments also have a picture as to how those investments will be sustained and made durable over the long run. And that's precise, you know, when I started there was a lot of, oh, the military does this, aid does this, state does this, and, and we don't, uh, you know, we don't seem to want to talk to each other. And, but, you know, you go out to, well, you know this, but out in Kabul, out in uh, Kandahar, it's a very different mindset. And, and people are able to sit down together and say, okay, this is our goal, how are we going to best achieve it? And what can we legitimately learn from seven, eight years of, uh, of effort here that will help us get there? So I think that's a big part of it. But I don't want to minimize the risk that people take on all sides of these operations in those types of environments. And I have tried to be a voice of realism uh, around what's possible and uh, the need to set priorities and go hard against those those, uh, those top priorities and, and figure out an implementation path that's more graduated for things that are not those top priorities. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Goltz, uh, Quincy Class of 96, and I'm going to talk about It's a pleasure to hear so many things that are happening. Can you pick up the microphone? Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about how we can establish a greater commitment by the American public. I mean, obviously, there, you mentioned the Saddleback Church. There's you know, high school students who are collecting money for bed nets. There's been, a, there's been a, a tremendous amount of interest. But how do you translate, how do you grow that interest and then translate it into a real commitment to development through USA, through our NGOs? Um, how do we broaden the scope of what we're seeing now? Well, I wish I had the answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that is exactly the challenge, and I think you described it very well. I think we can learn a lot from the Bush administration that I think did build a broader than usual uh, coalition by reaching out to, you know, people like to call it a strange bedfellows coalition. I don't know if Josh is still here and might speak to this, but, but you know, it, it, I think there are communities of faith that are deeply committed to this business leaders around the world uh, that are doing this work from a business perspective. You know, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Unilever, these companies want to play in these markets, recognize that to be credible and effective, they need to work on and, and have a passion for working on these core development issues and bring the kind of logistics excellence that, you know, frankly, has often been missing from the public sector in, in these uh, in these overall efforts. So they're very, very important from both a results perspective and a political constituency perspective. And I think, I think it, it's youth. I mean, I, and I think if we can supplement the humanitarian and NGO communities that have always been committed to this with the energy of young people who want to be, uh, want to express their desire to be some, part of something bigger and more important through their commitment to development with the hard-headed and very effective uh, thinking leadership and operational capabilities of businesses and business leaders and with the values driven outcome oriented work of communities of faith you begin to have a very very broad partnership but let's also be honest with ourselves you know USAID has not been over decades uh, has not garnered a reputation of being incredibly friendly to uh, communities of faith, for example. I mean, that's, I think that's just an honest thing. And I go, and part of why I'm reaching out uh, so uh, in such a focused way to those communities is I want to say that we are prepared to do things very differently to facilitate your success in this space. We're prepared to transition from being in a federal bureaucracy that implements programs to a platform that connects the energies and aspirations of different 
parts of the American public to this unbelievable mission to end poverty and prevent child death around the world. And we ultimately believe that by holding hands and learning from each other, we can do much better on the politics and on the results. And I just think that's a part of being realistic and honest about kind of our history and therefore what we need to do going forward. And let me close on this with a little bit of a story. I was at the Gates Foundation when Warren Buffett gave his extraordinary gift. And it was, you know, 45 or 50 billion dollars. And it just was extraordinary, right? And, and Warren is so straightforward in how he describes it. And he just said, well, I was looking for the best possible human investment in terms of, and this seemed like the highest return, so I made an investment. You know? and next question. And, uh, and, and, you know, and so I was there at that time. The day after that happened, my, I was flooded with phone calls. Corporate CEOs and senior vice presidents wanted to leave their jobs and come work with us. Um, people of wealth who would send us checks, who wanted to be part of this. And, and then we made an early decision that, well, we couldn't really accept all those checks, and we didn't really want to be a vehicle for doing that. And then we got checks from school kids, you know, a second grade classroom in the Pacific Northwest. It was like $17 or $12 they'd all put together, put in cash, and mailed it in. And, and then we said, well, we're going to process this one. Yeah. And I, uh, our joke was that it cost, I think there's someone from Gates here, right? That, uh, but, oh, hi there. Oh, hi. How are you? Uh, but it cost us something like $800 in legal fees to process that. But, it, it shows you, but I think it shows that the American people have such a fundamental commitment to this. More than half of all American families gave to the relief efforts in Haiti directly. The American, that's, that's more, that's, well, it's not more. The only thing that's not more than is the number of people who watch the Super Bowl together. But, but, but you know, but even coming close to the Super Bowl is a big deal, you know. And I, I just think we have a unique, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to invite this country into this mission. And I say this all the time inside my building, that 30 years ago, if you wanted to find all the development experts in the world, you'd have a World Bank USAID meeting and call it a day. And today, if you do that, you're missing out on the energy and the intellect and the insights of young inventors on college campuses and communities of faith that have tremendous power and value and uh, corporate leaders that are going to be the real transformational engines for some of these countries and communities, and you would miss the boat. And so, so we have to change to tap into that energy, and I think that energy is out there. Ma'am? Hi, Fatima Sumar, class of 06, and I'm the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee right now. Okay. And one of the areas we're looking at very closely in Afghanistan and Pakistan is our development assistance and our budgets. So the 2010 budget was about $4.4 billion for state aid uh, foreign assistance. And um, one of the challenges that we see is this pipeline problem that you're, you continuously have where, um, ironically or paradoxically, when you're at the height of conflict, you have the most resources thrown at, thrown at you. And the administration is always under fire to spend the resources quickly and then make a case to the appropriators and the rest of Congress that you need more money for future appropriations, even though we all know you cannot spend money quickly that well to do all the homework that you need to do. And so one of the challenges we're trying to figure out is how do you kind of solve this pipeline problem? Um, and there's some different suggestions that have been floated out there, whether it's some kind of trust fund in Afghanistan, for instance, that would be bi a bilateral kind of trust fund um, idea. In Pakistan, we're looking at this with Kerry Hinder, Berman, appropriation piece. Um, we convinced we're going to have problems with this in the future appropriation cycles to get to the $1.5 billion level. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this in terms of um, is it some kind of legislation that Congress needs to do, or how do you, how do you start changing the tune in Congress so that we're less obsessed with burn rates um, mm. and, and the annual appropriation cycle? Mm -hmm. Because we all know that yeah. development is generational and long term, but we do it in annual cycles. And it yeah. actually puts all the um, State Department and USA in this position where you're forced to do bad development to get development. Yeah, well, I, this is a dry run because I have to testify before your committee this week, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have the answer, yes, no, um, you, look, uh, 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 the, first of all, you're absolutely right that a focus on pipelines and burn rates instead of results and sustainability is what gets you into the trouble in the first place. Because the things people, the things that uh, bureaucracies do uh, in the context of a focus on things like burn rates, uh, I, I don't think constitute effective development. And so 
Uh, that's why we've tried to reorient aggressively around, around results. Now, that said, I think we have to make a stronger case that, that sometimes doing things well requires kind of planning and consultation, and that will take time, requires the stability of finance. There's a huge amount of data around, about best practices in development that show that uh, long-term stability of, of pr and predictability of finance is the primary driver of good development decision making and, and project implementation. Now it's obvious to anyone who's run an institution or a business or a division or a school, uh, you can't hire people if you think you have two year money because you know, most people don't take jobs for two years. You, you, need, you usually need to have a five or six year picture out on your financial future in order to build the kinds of institutions that are lasting and investing in the quality of human resources and management. So that's a little bit why I go back to my MBA point about, about business skills being so central to effective development execution. Our country is, has focused way too much on pipelines and burn rates. Uh, and, and we are trying aggressively to sort of make that transition. In Afghanistan, this is a little bit less of an issue than, uh, than one might think because when we have chosen to invest in things like large-scale energy infrastructure and other things that essentially require a certain amount of resources and we have a picture of what that's going to take over time and uh, we need to know that we have some financial predictability and we'll have success in getting our requested budgets. But, uh, but otherwise, the pipeline issue is not, uh, shouldn't be, I think, a major cause of concern in that context. In Pakistan, when you look at uh, the resources available against current spending plans, it stretches out for a longer period of time. Um, I would actually argue that that is a fundamentally important thing right now for our dialogue with the civilian secular government of Pakistan because they have a series of macroeconomic uh, issues that are going to challenge them over time and they really do need to know what their predictable sources of development finance are going to look like over the next 24 months in order to be able to make smart decisions about how they do energy pricing, how they manage their debt, um, how they handle their deficit to GDP ratio, and how they negotiate their next uh, package with the World Bank and the IMF. So, uh, but, but, I, but I couldn't agree more that this focus, especially in Washington, on pipelines and burn rates leads to decision making that's suboptimal, and we have to have a smarter conversation about that. Okay, these are our last two questions, so why don't you two ask your, your questions not together, but, uh, and then you can answer both questions and wrap up and we'll get you to abstract. Thank you. <laughs> And what do you mean by vertical systems so and horizontal? We're talking about malaria and HIV yes. disease Got it. Good. versus health systems strengthening yeah. in general. Both are critical, um, but how do you make that allocation of resources? Great. Thank you. Okay. And our last question? My name is Josh Hart, I'm homeschooled. Uh, do you think that having uh, the move to an export oriented economy in our country could indeed in the future help with international development? Great question, good. Well, let, let me thank you for both of those. On, on health and on how we think about vertical versus horizontal systems, uh, I, I am a realist. And here's my perspective on reality. I think it's perfectly natural for the American public and their representatives in Congress to expect that our resources are, are generating real results and outcomes and saving lives because you know, that's, I think, what motivates a lot of the commitments in global health. To report out that way and to make that case, uh, we need programs and funding structures that allow us to say, if you provide us with these resources in HIV, we can save these people through the following set of treatments. If you provide these resources in malaria, we can do these three or four things that will do that. The same is true for the 350,000 women that still die in childbirth, um, 300,000 of them is just absolutely needless, and by putting a uh, skilled attendant, not even a medical professional, at, at birth with them, you, you would save more than half of those lives automatically. 
Uh, so, so we have a lot of these areas where there are tremendous buys uh, in terms of human health at very, very low cost. New rotavirus and pneumococcal conjugate vaccines for about three to five dollars a dose can save 400,000 kids a year who die under the age of five in poor, the poorest communities around the world. And we know we can reach them, we know the vaccines are there, and it's just a matter of <coughs> summoning the political will and getting the job done. So those, I, I just feel like that's the dialogue we should be having because that's how we both motivate and hold ourselves to real account in terms of reporting out on what we achieve for what we invest. That said, in countries, uh, systems managers and ministries, ministers of health and others don't necessarily look at their budgets that way. They look at their budgets the way we look at our budgets here. We have capital expenses and recurrent expenses, mostly human resources and commodities. And so we need to be able to balance that. And we need to make investments and go after the types of outcomes that we know are most likely to help countries build systems they can afford and sustain over time. And the President's Global Health Initiative, which we launched uh, two years ago, is our effort to do that. We're basically trying to prioritize malaria, saving women's lives at birth, child survival, and continue the great progress in HIV and TB. And while doing that, focus on a few systems indicators related to human resources and community health workers and uh, local drug management systems that help us know we're getting more efficiencies and more bang for our buck. And by doing that in Mali, for example, we took five independent campaigns, all trying to reach kids, one with vitamin A, one with vaccines, one with bed nets, and a couple others, put them together, reduced the total cost by 50%, and got the same outcomes. Uh, in Kenya, we did the same thing by using the PEPFAR platform and, and USAID's community health worker platforms uh, to provide maternal health services. We were able to expand maternal health services in Kenya from two of eight districts to all eight districts at no additional cost. And you know, in global health, perhaps more than any other area, saving lives saves uh, saving money saves lives. And so, so it's our job to be efficient and good about that. But the truth is, it's harder to go around the country selling the idea that you know that health systems. You know, it's just it's too much of a of a complex construct and it's not as tied into results. So we just have to do both in that context. And on the other question with respect to exports, I have, uh, I, you know, through the President's Export Initiative, come to value and learn about the centrality of development partners in building new export markets. In the biggest sense of the term, you know, South Korea was our biggest development partner through the 60s and 70s. Uh, and is now a donor themselves, is a trading partner to whom we export more goods and services than we do France, and, uh, and we have a huge number of jobs related to those export opportunities. So in the big picture, having viable markets uh, that we can partner with is how we will succeed and win the future. But even in a more micro sense, our food security programs now in India and in Sub-Saharan Africa that help very poor farmers gain access to very cheap, low-cost micro-irrigation technologies. These are just plastic piping systems that help them grow vegetables and double their incomes and improve their child's nutrition and have these amazing consequences, are powered in many cases by a small solar panel uh, that is cheap and low-cost and made by a company named Suniva in Georgia. And, that, and we have created 300 jobs in Georgia. They're just about to open a second plant in Michigan. And it would be harder for them to be engaged in these types of business opportunities without being tied into uh, the general efforts we're trying to make in global development. And it goes back a little bit to the Development Innovation Venture Fund, that I, I think there's a huge amount of entrepreneurial potential for people to reach what are otherwise thought of as relatively poor <coughs> markets. Uh, or markets made up of poor people, the bottom billion, the bottom two billion, or three billion, however you want to describe it. And someday that will be a major export category. We want to play and participate in that, and the development community has a lot to offer there. So thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
have a, a panel on philanthropy, and then we'll go straight into uh, Professor Emily Lago's closing keynote. Thanks.